welcome back to the show. The cool thing about Blurry Creatures, Judd, is like we've become legitimate friends. We've talked on the phone. We text. That's the cool thing about what we're doing here in Blurry Creatures is it feels more than just a podcast. Building community, making friends, and there's real life connections. So welcome yeah. back to the show, man. And I just wanted to say that to everyone listening. Well, I, thank you, man. I, I I love this show. It's one of my favorite shows to do. Not just saying that. Thanks, Judd. I, I wish you guys would beat me in on a three way. I feel like I'm a little left out here. Like there's a like someone there's a, a milkshake with two straws, and I'm just trying to. I'm out here with my third well, straw, just well, hanging we out. We got a, we got a third we got a third straw. <laughs> yeah. No problem. All right. In the age Deal. in the age of coronavirus, we don't even care. It doesn't yeah. even matter. This, this, this is a this is a bottomless milkshake, Dude, I'm man. Just try, I, yeah, I'm just trying to build up my immune system. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Exactly. Everyone else is afraid, and Luke's diving in. I'm like, I'm licking all the doorknobs. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, Judd, you know, Luke and I have been dancing around all kinds of subjects with the Watchers and aliens and all kinds of weird topics have been on the show. And Luke, do how did we? What was the episode that we stumbled on the Temple of the Watchers? You yeah, Judd, I, I think you talked a bit about this with Derek, with our friend Derek Gilbert, and mm-hmm. it was something that piqued uh, piqued my interest and Nate's interest because it you know it brings in all the Genesis six stuff we've talked about, and then it also brings in archaeology and the archaeological record, which we like to talk about because you being a Dr. Jed Burton and us dealing in empirical evidence as well as theology and everything else that comes along with a Bigfoot podcast that delves into the realms of, of craziness and, and with a biblical worldview. So that was always fascinating. So one of the things that Nate and I had talked about was having you back to talk about this Temple of the Watchers. And, and, and to our listeners that don't aren't aware of it, and mostly for, for me, I don't know how, how much Nate's looking into this, but I'd love for you to kind of expouse upon what that is, why we think it has to do with the Watchers, where it is, and I'm just going to break that down in the uh, Burton Beyond style that you bring. That's my style, man. Yeah, I know. Well, before we we take the deep dive, I mean, Gobekli Tepe is the site that we're talking about uh, in, t- in terms of the Temple of the Watchers. It's been referred to as the Temple of the Watchers by a number of people, some of whom who have been, you know, Christian or biblical kind of fringe scholars, if you will, but others who have been... Um, I don't know. Is there a mainstream fringe? Is there like a, that's, that's that's kind of an oxymoron, I guess. But uh, the, I'm, anyway, point that I'm making here is that it's Gobekli Tepe. And before I get too far into this, I, I, I did want to introduce this the right way. You know, it, it is a growing family. It's a network of human beings. It's not just talking heads. I have a growing new family too of students who are just stellar, just fantastic, and really good friends um, who are sort of discovering a new side to me, I, I suppose, especially after I moved back home. So I, I just wanted to give a shout out to, to a couple of friends, Stacy and, and Pam, who are listening tonight. Um, so hi, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Back to Gobekli Tepe and the Temple of the Watchers. Now, this, this is a, a topic that my colleague and I, Dr. Aaron Judkins, have been writing on for a while, got a, a forthcoming book on the subject of the Bible and Gobekli Tepe. On the surface, it would seem like Gobekli Tepe does not really have a whole lot to do with the Bible. It's a, a Neolithic site, Mesolithic site in e- southeastern Turkey near the headwaters of the Euphrates. It dates back to about 10,000 B.C., or 10,500 BC, is probably the oldest temple complex in the world. It's generally referred to as such because uh, it's the earliest archaeological evidence that we have of this shift between uh, our, our Neolithic forebears beginning to think about their gods in terms of, of anthropomorphism. In other words, their gods looked human-like rather than the prevailing religion of, of hunters, hunters and gatherers that had, had heretofore, theretofore been animism or a, a general worship of spirits and ancestors, and especially totemism because they were hunters. That was the animal spirit aspect. And so in the iconography at Gobekli Tepe, this is very clear uh, because the pillars that held up the arguably what were skin, animal skin roofs, are all anthropomorphic. 
um, they have human features and uh, are grand in scale compared to the average size of, of humans in that part of the world at the time. And so, you know, mainstream archaeology has done a wonderful job in bringing this the history of this site uh, to the foreground, and it's been a hot topic ever since. Um, and we owe a great debt of gratitude to the late Professor Klaus Schmidt, who was in charge of, of the bulk of those excavations. Something I used to tell my students is that uh, it, it, Gobekli Tepe is, is one of these nuggets of civilization that existed millennia before uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, the Indus River Valley civilization, and should be called such because it meets the classical criteria of what a, a civilization, a city-state is. We have other examples like uh, pre-Natufian or Natufian Jericho in Israel, Tel Caramel in Syria, uh, Chateau Hayuk uh, also in Turkey, but on the, the South Central Plateau. Uh, and there, there's a, a list of them that meet those criteria. And so in reality, what we have is archaeologically supported evidence of civilizations millennia before. But what I used to tell my students is that for the longest time, um, archaeology and humanities in general subscribe to uh, the archaeologist Veer Gordon Child's thesis of the Neolithic Revolution. In other words, what he meant by that is that is that there were these social changes in organization, but they were brought about by agriculture. Those are the two, two parts of this Neolithic Revolution. Uh, and so according to Child and any number of archaeologists and anthropologists after him, agriculture had to be the bedrock of city-state dwelling. Well, not only is Gobekli Tepe a good example of civilization before what we thought were the earliest civilizations, but it it blows the thesis of, of agriculture as the bedrock of civilization out the window uh, because the main reason for Gobekli Tepe's existence is religion. It's the religious impetus, uh, the, the pull to to create this temple complex, this huge temple complex was multiple structures. It was that, it was, it was religious that formed the bedrock of this society. And agriculture was epiphenomenal. It came in the wake of all of that as a result of the growing population, um, which didn't, from what we can tell, didn't stick around all year long. You had some religious functionaries that did, but there were outlying settlements that suggested at certain times of the year, there's a pretty substantial number of people here. And so to feed all of those folks, agriculture in the form of amur wheat, I think, uh, first cultivated and then, and then grown seasonally, came about after uh, the religious rationale for the whole building of the site to begin with. Hey, Judd, one of the things, uh, can we talk about a couple questions just before, we, yeah. just for context? How how much does this predate the flood? Does it predate the flood, as if we're putting it in biblical terms? Not by much. Okay. Uh, in my estimation. Uh, not by much, I, I would say. Um, so this, but probably, this is pre-flood, though. We're talking about something that would... It's pre, yeah, yeah. Its origins are pre-flood. Okay. Um, but, but it's right towards the end of the last ice age and, and what conventional dating w would would say was the late Pleistocene era. You know, we're, we're starting to see the sea levels rise. The whole species of megafauna are, are dying out or, or hunted out in many cases, um, leading up to this series of events known as the Younger Dryas period, uh, which I think contributed to the Noahic flood. But yeah, we're, we're talking about pre-flood. And the other question I have is, is, is one of the things I've heard about uh, Gebekli Tepe is that it's, it's kind of, it, it's an anomaly, right? It, it blows a lot of theories out of the water because you have yeah. all these hunter gatherers apparently. And then all of a sudden there's this advanced stone building and agriculture, almost like what would seem to be overnight, right? It's, it's kind of this crazy, it threw the big monkey wrench and really it, it threw a wrench in this whole timeline that had people had assumed it happened right like oh well people just started gathering in, in, into more communities and they started ag like you were saying and but this is just like all of a sudden there's yeah 
there's a <laughs> the megaliths and and stone stone circles and temples uh, when right. when there wasn't really organizational habitation. I guess you would say like right. up to this point. Right. Um, don't you mean hominid wrench instead hominid. of monkey hey, wrench? There he is. There's you the, open the there. door. There like, I, I had, had to do hey, I gotta it. Serve to do a, it. I got to serve a few of those up for you, right? That, that's right. That's right. I'm sorry I didn't throw you the signal. No, uh, it's, I, I'll it's remember good. that next we'll just, time. just give you the... <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's funny that the baseball, sort of the baseball references, Nate and I were exchanging texts this week, and it's a, it's a really dumb inside joke, but we went to a giant mound. This is really poorly... Poor, poor excursion on our part. We just go to see this giant mound near where we live, this, this mound uh-huh. city. And Nate shows up wearing a San Francisco Giants hoodie for this for this trip. And I'm like, well, you just, you're gonna, you just think, make everybody think you're playing for the home team here? Or, oh, yeah. or, or, right, right, right. <laughs> so right, it's this exactly. thing. It's like, are you wearing your Giants, dude? Are you, are you wearing you're gonna wear your Giants uh, your Giants jersey so you can play for the home team? Um, yeah. It's neither here nor there. That's, that's a little messed up, man. I, I just got to say. Yeah. Out, out yeah, I know, right? Are you a, you're a Rangers fan? Down there, I, I well, I've I've essentially thrown most professional sports out of my watching rotation. For, <laughs> for, you wouldn't you wouldn't I, consider them part of you wouldn't be watching. Oh no, oh, oh, no! Oh, 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 I, 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 I see what you you're did no there. longer yeah. a watcher. Yeah, I'm no oh, longer a watcher. Baseball. I, I I was a I was a Rangers fan. <laughs> for a while but uh, you know i mean i'd almost rather watch high school sports so, now, just for- joe, do you, joe would you say that like sports no longer makes an incursion into your life man you guys <laughs> need here. to take this you, you, need, you need to take this act on the road i'm, I'm telling you <laughs> uh, yeah big we, laughs we might, laughs. To, we might have to might uh, okay have to. If, hey let's get back to get back to the tabby quick question how far sure. how far is this from uh mount herman the places that we would consider to be the epicenter of because I know we're getting well, to the watchers well, eventually here. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it's I don't I don't know the exact distance, but it's um, it's in southeastern Turkey, just on the on this on the other side of the the Syrian border. Um, so I mean, geographically speaking, you know, it's it's four degrees of latitude, you know, lines down basically. Because uh, Gobekli Tepe's on the thirty seventh latitude, Mount Hermon's on about the thirty third. Um, so comparatively speaking, not, not that far as the crow flies, as it were. Well, let's get, I, we I interrupted your, your flow here, but I just had, I wanted to kind of put this in, in cr- chronological space for my mind as, you know, we, sure. we talk about things that happened pre-flood. We talk about post-flood. We talk about, you know, all the things that happened with the Nephilim in Genesis six. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then, so I kind of wanted to figure out where this, where this lines up and, you know, we haven't even gotten to some of the like the pre-Adamic like people. So the people out there, and like, does this have anything yeah. to do with that? You know, so yeah. Well, you know, the chronologies are 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 difficult and problematic for a number of reasons. You know, because you have pe- some people subscribe to a young Earth chronology, some people subscribe to an old Earth chronology. I I personally subscribed, and I'm comfortable with an old Earth chronology. I just don't think that the macro evolutionary sort of take on that is is valid scientifically uh you know but punctuated equilibrium kind of jumps and you know um automatic speciation there's a, that, that just doesn't make a whole lot of scientific uh sense to me but a, as to your question about you know gobekli tepe being a, a a kind of 90 degree angle cultural change for humanity that's very true because for millennia millions of years even possibly we had been hunter gatherers and horticulturalists uh, almost perennially uh, wherever humans were on on the globe and in the mesolithic you had this little cluster of stations before civilization if you will uh, that that sort of blow that out of the water and one of the arguments that i make by by drawing on an analogy about Gobekli Tepe in this unique sort of cultural context in which it springs up is that typically in human history, the only time kinds of drastic changes take place, and we're still talking human agency here. Um, and I, I'm taking a, a, a page out of uh, Jared Diamond's approach 
to world history. The fellow that wrote um, Guns, Germs, and Steel, if you're at all familiar with that, he and I have some theoretical differences, not the least of which is evolution, but uh, I do find his, his analysis very interesting. And he says that uh, it's a history of the world, but the, the Guns, Germs, and Steel uses the, the clash between the Spanish on the one hand under Pizarro and the Inca under Atahualpa on the other hand. So the old world and the new world clash in the early 16th century. And the argument that he's making is that the, the reason that it was so drastic a change and such a, a, a irreversible uh, turn for indigenous societies in the new world is because of all of these causes that had been set up in the old world uh, millennia before the, the Spaniards even arrived, um, starting with geography. Uh, the Eurasian continent is long east to west. The North America and South America are long north to south. And he posited that it was, you know, once agriculture emerged, once an animal husbandry and civilization and metallurgy and all those ki kinds of things emerged, it was easier for them to spread out along similar latitudes because there was the climate was similar. The terrain was not terribly different. Uh, you didn't have those kinds of obstacles. Whereas in the new world, when civilization and agriculture and things like that spr sprouted up, Basically, every climate on the planet and every geographical obstacle uh, on the planet kept that movement exponentially slower than what you saw in the old world. And he also talks about, um, um, you know, things like epidemiology, um, because people in the old world had herd animals like, uh, you know, cattle and sheep and horses and pigs and goats and things like that. They were exposed to the diseases uh, in those herd populations and over time, you know, became somewhat inoculated over them, like, you know, bovine diseases like, like anthrax and smallpox. So by the time they get to the new world in the 1500s, the Spanish, because of things that started millennia before that generation was even on the earth, they were set up not because they were braver or more capable or better people or, or, or what have you than the indigenous population in the new world, but people in the new world had no herd animals. They hadn't been exposed to these pathogens. I've already outlined the difficulties of the spread of culture in, in, in technology and things like that in the new world. And so because of these, these distal causes, you had this great drastic change largely detrimental and, and, and arguably irreversible on not just the Inca who, who were the test, you know, sort of the test subjects here, but all of Native American civilization uh, suffered from both uh, military and, and conquest depredations, but perhaps even more so the sort of unconscious biological warfare that was taking place. Now, I also think that there was an outside influence in these early civilization examples. But the kind of, of distal causes necessary to set up this, this superior race, if you will, you know, superior in terms of technology, in terms of what they were able to do. We're talking about, if you want to start with geography like Diamond does, we're talking about extra dimensional geography. You know, the, and the argument that that we're making in this book is that it was the watchers. They were the only ones who could come in this outside influence and make this drastic change on humanity. Otherwise, statistically, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Quantitatively, it doesn't make a lot of sense for this kind of cultural shift to take place almost, you know, in the blink of an eye in terms of geological history, in terms of, of longitudinal history. And so you're, you're left with, you know, when you turn to the supernatural as sort of the missing variable in this equation and things start to fall in line. And I think you almost have to, especially when you consider the reason for the building of Gobekli Tepe in the first place. And I mean, let me make a great point. That's kind of what I was getting at is that you have a sudden infusion of knowledge and technology out of a seemingly thin air, which mm -hmm. 
obviously we know we know that's that's <laughs> That's that's right in the playbook of the watchers, right? It's to it's to it's to hand these, to hand this knowledge, and this secret and this mystery religions and this mystery knowledge and to precisely you know, yeah. To I mean, offering. they set them. Yeah. If you want identities for the gods of of Gobekli Tepe, then look no further than the watchers. You know, I, I'm I'm convinced that this was also a, a kind of military outpost. For the watchers too and this sort of leads us into why the the region is biblically significant because it's in eastern turkey it's it's arguably near where eden was because we have of course we have two of the we know where two of the rivers are for sure and where their headwaters are and so with those geographical pinpoints uh we we can surmise with with a, a degree of certitude that Eden was somewhere in eastern Turkey. The Watchers would have known that, even if they didn't know the exact location. They knew that they could set up shop close to it because, again, they've got privy to knowledge uh, that that humanity didn't. I, I surmise and posit in the book that they they either thought that they could overpower the angel that guarded Eden there. Or they thought that because this was a, a, you know, thinking in terms of of Satan's activity as a kind of coup d'etat uh, or, or an un- unsuccessful, at least a, a coup, that this political movement, this theopolitical movement, to borrow a word from Sharon Gilbert, would garner followers, you know, gradually, or it would seem gradually over time, you know, from our perspective, and so they they may have thought that they could persuade. Uh, the angels and that the angel that was guarding Eden, the um, but they knew that this place was different because, you know, you read in Genesis about Adam and Eve walking around in the garden with God, so it was this strange country in Earth where the heavenly realm and the earthly realm somehow seemed to touch. And my suspicion is that what you have here is is what the Watchers and their Rephaim, uh, Nephilim, and, and especially Rephaim in the post-flood uh, wanted to do. They, they never lost sight of trying to get back into heaven and overthrow Yahweh. And so you've got a, pre, a sort of Tower of Babylon scenario here because it's pretty clear that we're not just talking about a, a, a ziggurat in terms of the Tower of Babel. Is it was something far more than that. Um, I think that they thought they could weaponize somehow what was at Eden to be able to do a similar kind of assault on heaven and use, you know, if you could use the word technology there, to try and use it in a similar way that you see Nimrod doing that with the Tower of Babel uh, in the post-flood world. Because this this seems to be one of the things throughout the biblical narrative that's constantly on the minds of the watchers first. Clearly, it still is, even for the apostate angels who are, who are chained up, uh, and their their forebears, their minions, the demons. Yeah, it's interesting, Jed. Like, do you do you think it was when you talk about military? I mean, one of the things we talk about is when is when humanity is ejected from the garden. God places an angel with a flaming sword at the gate. Right? There's it's Bible's pretty specific about that. And there's a lot of theories about why why you would guard Eden. And is it, you know, is, is the, is the tree of, you know, is the tree of life, the, and we've talked about this actually with, with Tim, Nate, yeah. about whether that, that actually is the key to immortality. And, mm-hmm. you know, and even with the, with the angelic beings that, you know, when God judges them in Psalm 82, they'll die like men that they, part of the reason that they can't, they lose their immortality is not, is being judged by God is also being ejected from the ability to eat from the tree. Now, I mean, that's a lot of stuff going on, but do you, I know you said Babel. Do you think that mm-hmm. in some, in some ways this out is all, not only just temple, but this is an outpost from which to essentially assault Eden. Whether Yes. It's both. Okay. It's both because I mean, the, the, and again, we sort of have to enter the, the mythological mind to, to kind of understand that. Um, because those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive uh, in the realm of the supernatural. Um, you know, I used the word technology a minute ago, but, you know, magic is just as apt uh, when you're dealing with something that sophisticated. 
And this, I mean, this the crazy thing about this this thing too with Gubekli Tepe, is if you read up on it, is is these are like the these are the first stone circles too. I mean, is, can you talk about that? I mean, because we see that replicated again at Stonehenge, and, we, and then you see it yeah. in the gi- the wheel of the giants, and mm-hmm. this is something mm-hmm. that began somewhere, and maybe it appears that it began here. Yeah, and typically in 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 uh, you know in religious studies and world religions. You know, most scholars agree that circles represent the um, the celestial. You know, the the beyond. Um, that seems to be a pretty universal feature. So when you run into these things, it, it's really interesting. And I, I sort of stumbled on this um, in research. That's probably going to have to go in an, another book, a sequel book to this. To the east, on, uh, generally on this, or, or to the west, excuse me, of Gobekli Tepe, generally on the same latitude line, the 37th latitude, uh, you run into the island of Patmos. Of course, John the Revelator wrote, you know, the, the Revelation, the Apocalypse. If you continue on that line uh, through the Mediterranean, you also run into a site which, in my estimation, is turning out to be probably the best the best candidate for Atlantis that we've come across. Mm. And it's, it's on the coastal region of Cadiz, Spain. Uh, and of course, Atlantis, and you can actually see this from, from aerial photography and um, uh, imaging that they've done is that there are, you can tell that there are these concentric circles uh, that existed in this site that dates back between, again, the timelines it lines up really well, uh, dates back to between 12 and 10,000 BC. Uh, which would make it contemporary with Gobekli Tepe. You spin the globe, and in on the 37th parallel uh, in the United States, you run into UFO Alley, mm. you know, from coast to coast. Uh, and then, interestingly enough, I also discovered that Chaco Canyon, uh, the the Anasazi site, and uh, Mesa Verde, the other Anasazi site, are on either side, just just of that latitude line. Uh, of course, th- both of those sites contain extensive kivas, the circular sort of pit temples or pit shrines that the Anasazi would worship in. So you've got a whole t- series, and that's just a superficial, you know, survey on my part. But you've got a whole series of of these sites that have these circles in them that were used in the religious ceremonies and and had you know, d- direct purpose in the, the religious ideation of these people. I f- and I find that because it's on the 37th parallel, I find it hard to believe that that's incidental. Jed, why, why is that? I mean, cause we, we haven't really talked much into this. And so I think this is, this is a really, this is a really good topic. Like in, j- or mm-hmm. just even a little, a good caveat. Like there's, I, I've watched enough videos and seen enough thing about things about the pyramids and these temples, these really big stone, like megalithic, temples mm-hmm. that all exist on certain parallels or corresponding spots on different parts of the planet. Mm-hmm. Like what, mm-hmm. you know, and people, people espouse a bunch of ideas, right? It's like, it has to do with energy or, and you know, these are, these are power plants and they all were set in certain places, specific and strategic mm-hmm. places. Then you look at it and it's like, they are so strategically put. It's like you, it's like you threw, you put a pin on the, on the globe, like you were put, mm-hmm. but why, what, what is it? In, in your mind, why? What's the significance of the thirty seventh parallel, or you know the the, that, the lines that the pyramids on and the temples on? Yeah, I mean, that's a fantastic question. I mean, I'm still grappling with it myself, but you know, clearly, you know, there's there's something to be said about the 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 thesis about ley lines. Uh, is what they've historically been called. Um, you know, like you, like you said, you know, everybody kind of has their own take on what they were. Personally, I don't know. I, I tend to think that they had something to do with, with the facet of stone technology that we're least familiar with. Of course, we're all, when, when most people hear stone technology, they think lithics, they think, you know, dart points, spearheads, flint knives, rock hammers, that kind of thing. But there's some facet of stone technology that we, we at the end of the day, we have to admit, we don't exactly know how it was used, how they built, you know, at least a, a significant portion of these, particularly the megalithic structures. 
Uh, what we do know is that a lot of the rock they use uh, is piezoelectric. So it, it conducted, they conducted uh, various kinds of electricity well. Just under the auspices of speculation here, you know, you could think of your computer or your smartphone as a collection of rocks and crystals. That's basically what it is. I mean, it's rare earth minerals, you know, silver, lithium, quartz put together in a particular way. You know, all of those things ex existed on earth at that time. Um, there's no reason to think that, that particularly given, you know, a one up, let's say, on the technology by these extra dimensional beings, the watchers, uh, that humanity wouldn't be able to utilize that kind of technology. And I think that's, that's one of the, the big untold stories, the details of which, I, you know, I'm still trying to piece together. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of researchers, a lot of scholars with open minds would agree with me that there's a, a substantial component of, so-called stone age technology that was highly sophisticated that we don't understand at this point. Oh yeah. I mean, we talk, we talk with Derek Olson, Nate, about like, mm -hmm. what I think they call the walls, like the morphic the, or the metamorphic walls. Like you have these, these non square walls see over the planet, right? The wall. The, the, yeah. The like the, especially were, the, were, yeah. Like the ones in Peru yep. in particular. Yeah. But they exist. They exist other places on the planet too. It's, sure. it's bizarre. It's almost like the, the rocks were melted into place. Yeah, or yeah. It's, that stuff, yeah, that stuff we don't know, and, and it's 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 shocking. As intelligent as we think we are and have become, yeah. And what's amazing and disheartening to me is that you know so many of my peers are are in academia are, are afraid to to go there. They're they're afraid to say I don't know <laughs> about something, and I, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean even if it's somewhat fantastical and sort of stretches the imagination, you know, it, it isn't that reason to continue questioning it and not, not necessarily poo pooing every, yeah. you know, every hypothesis that comes along. It's hard. Um, it's, it's, yeah. You just get in that group think and you continue to plow the field and you push it that far and you just got to keep going, you know? Right. That's 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 a, that's what a lot of what we hear on this is just, you know, people are very initially pretty skeptical that how could all this stuff just be so easily hidden, and how come no one talks about it? You know, the the, the more society barrels on, and like all the all things that are that, that are helpful for you to make sense of the world seem to be hidden, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in in a lot of cases, yeah. Um, Seems like by design. Well, I, I'm sure that that you know that that that's part of it. Um, you guys have heard me talk about early civilizations before these, you know, civilizations before, like we're talking about today, before Mesopotamia and Egypt. And there's a real issue in the, the textbook industry and the public publishing industry for college textbooks and and you know high school textbooks that deal with ancient history and world history. They typically treat prehistory as this sort of speed bump this semi quasi knowable speed bump to get on to the, you know, what they consider the more valuable uh, in the, the first real civilization, which of course is preposterous is absurd. It doesn't even fit their own, their own narrative. Uh, but Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Harappans, those are the big three that are pushed as the earliest contenders for civilization. When, if we use the same criteria, that we judge those civilizations by to look at sites like Gobekli Tepe, Chateau Hayuk, Natufian Jericho, Tel Karamal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then we, at the end of the day, we have to say that these are also civilizations and they are 7,000, 6,000, 5,000 years older than Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Harappa. You know, people can, can pull on that, that thread if they want to, because the evidence is there. You know, I, I used to get, college textbooks to review almost every semester and I was just flabbergasted at, at you know every now and then you, you'd get a, a reference to Gobekli Tepe you know Jericho and, and I, I could understand in the case of Gobekli Tepe uh, because there's only there's just over you know a couple of decades of archaeology on, on done on the site but in the case of Jericho 
uh, those excavations date back to the early and mid part of the last century. And so we're talking decades, you know, almost a hundred years of work on, uh, on Jericho. And so these aren't, you know, these aren't sort of academic rhapsodies to say that these things were civilization. There's tons of quantitative archaeological data to support uh, that these were civilizations. Judd, as you put on your your mythology hat here, and I've got it on. Yeah, I know. I do actually. <laughs> and, and we talk about the actual building of a temple, right? This is the first. This is maybe the first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What the first? Is this the first? Is this the first? Yeah, this seems to be the the oldest temple in the in the classical sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you think the purpose is here? Is this is this a uh, I mean, listen. They're setting up an actual place for the. Is this is this HQ? Yeah, I mean, well, yeah. There's that, but like, are these? Uh-huh. Is this just is this just a the counterfeiting of of the temple in heaven? Is this is this is this a, is this a, is this a centralizing of the of the, this is the beginning of the occult? Like, in, in a lot of ways, yeah. I mean, I think that's why I call Gobekli Tepe an outpost. I think HQ to use uh, what what Nate was was talking about i think hq is still the mount Hermon region mm-hmm. that, that's still you know i think that's still ground zero uh but clearly you know you're looking at ev- evidence of their their machinations in other parts of the world yeah it is the beginning of well it's it, it's the, it is the beginning of things like witchcraft and magic uh but it's also it's also combining them with with practical sciences um and so you're seeing like a um, and it extends beyond that too. I mean, just, just in terms of culture, um, you know, earlier in the year when I wrote that paper on the war of the words, you know, the manipulation of, of language and culture, it, not only the ma- manipulation, but the perversion, the make the, the making of culture anathema, uh, to the way it was intended, you know, taking something like, like a, a just loving ruler like Yahweh and his kingdom and then flipping it on its head, you know, as the absolutist despot, self-aggrandizing, you know, self-deifying, you know, tyrant, essentially, that that you find in in these, particularly the later civilizations like Mesopotamia and Egypt. Um, but they're, they're all virtually theocratic monarchies. And so um, I don't consider Gobekli Tepe to be ground zero, but it's definitely a crucial outpost particularly when you consider that region lies on the, the periphery uh, between the proto-Semitic and the proto-Indo-European worlds, that, that proto-Indo-European being that region between the, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, uh, where the languages of, of Eurasia were said to have sprung from. You know, and I, not, not to retread old tires, but, you know, we, we, we covered some of that ground, you know, in the discussion about that paper I wrote. But the, the big example there being the word for king, starting with, a, a, you know, the, the initial morpheme or syllable, starting with an R followed by a vowel. And, of course, you know, you, you don't get too far into it. And there, there's just a profusion on both sides of the proto-Indo-European heartland, if you will. And arguably, it... it it certainly has ramifications for the the ancient Near East and the prehistoric Near East because the the earliest Mesopotamian civilization, the Sumerians, actually came from that region uh, of the the Transcaucasus, the, the Proto Indo European heartland. Uh, they were not a Semitic people. Um, in fact, the name their their indigenous name is Kian Gir, and they would have you know over millennia made their way down from that that region of the Transcaucasus into Eastern Turkey and been exposed to the remnants, the legacy of all that watcher influence. And then of course they bring it to Mesopotamia and they become the mother civilization of Mesopotamia. So there's, you know, tracking along the lines of, of mythology and the establishment of a, a, you know, a religion based on these, these uh, anthropomorphic deities, which is what you have in the ancient Near East and certainly the ancient Mediterranean world and, and in many other parts of the world, you know, these things set themselves up as the elder gods, sort of the, the equivalent of the Titans in Greek mythology and their, their progeny who did rebel against them, 
you know, the Nephilim and the, the chimeric Nephilim as well, um, were, were the, they, along with the post-flood Rephaim, were like the, the Olympian uh, and the, the other sub sort of taxons uh, of, of lesser gods in that pantheon. Yeah, it's it's, Hercu- it's Hercules, right? And yeah, well, I mean, it, 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 and all that. Yes, it, it jobs very well with the divine council thesis. You know, we're we're talking about the same thing. You know, that it's all a perversion of what of Yahweh's original divine council. You know, where you see it mimicked in all these other places, but it's you know, it's a cloudy, shadowy reflection uh, of the pure and original. Right. They put the serpent at the top of the at the top of the uh, the pile. Precisely, yeah, of Yahweh. and you, you know, it, a lot of these cir- it, that may have something to do with the reason that these temples were circular was a kind of nod to the Nakash, uh, the serpent, of Satan in the garden, uh, because a lot of these you know circles also can be interpreted as the Ouroboros, the snake swallowing its own tail. This was a a, a a symbol known in antiquity and arguably in prehistory too, um, that was well known in the 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 most antique corners of of the ancient Near East. Um, and in fact, um, you know, you, you mentioned one of them that was in the Phoenician backyard, Gilgal Raphaim, which is in the the Golan, uh, could be interpreted as a. a an Ouroboros as well, because it's right next to a, a feature that Doug Van Dorn uh, discovered called the Serpent Mount. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the very name, Bathan, uh, in Ugaritic means the land of the serpent. And so I suspect that that in some way these are, are iconic and emblematic, a kind of nod to the Nakash, because the Ouroboros represents... Um, well, just like circles, it represents the celestial, the eternal. Um, it represents um, the cycles of life and seasons and things like that, birth and, and death and rebirth. <clears throat> and, and what do you think about like modern day like films, like some of the like you know the Marvel movies that are kind of hinting at a lot of this stuff? Do they dig all the way back to this too, and they're kind of write it into their their stories? And there's this constant theme. Like a great external threat is headed towards the planet, and it's going to take, you know, these u- unique individuals to to repel it. Something along those lines. Yeah, like just yeah. the themes of, uh, you know, there's these demigods of old, and it's mm-hmm. kind of repackaged in a new thing, and it seems like the same story is being told over and over and over and over again. Um, mm-hmm. But we're talking about the original, the OG, right? Right. Spot. Yeah, I, I, I'm in 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 a way. I do think um, you know the both the major comic houses uh, and other ones too, uh, outside of Marvel and DC ha- have done this. In large part, superheroes have, have kind of taken over the role of of those stories um, that we find in in mythology, and some of them come directly out of mythology. Uh, you know, in the case of Marvel, you have Thor who was the son of Odin in Thor and Loki uh, were sons of Odin in uh, uh, Germanic and no- Norse mythology in uh, the DC universe. I mean, Wonder Woman is, is an Amazon who you find, you know, prolifically in, you know, in, in a number of, of instances in Greek mythology. Aquaman was from the kingdom of Atlantis. Uh, and so you've got, you've got this sort of connection back to the, the ancient, specifically the classical world and on the part of DC and then Germanic. And I mean, both of those, both of those universes are quite diffuse in terms of the, um, you know, the personages that they're peopled by, but yeah, you're right. I mean, um, to me, the, the, the more disturbing elements that get picked up in pop culture are the ones that show up on, on TV series and movies that deal more directly with the occult, um, you know, where that, that turn things like vampires and werewolves and witches and things like that into, you know, the protagonist of a story or the hero of a story. Uh, that that is a very dangerous uh, dalliance that the pop culture has been uh, comfortable with for a long time. Yeah, it's the conditioning. It's the conditioning of, of creating a, a sympathetic 
character out of a sure. evil entity, right? I mean, it's sure. Do you think that that this site, this original site, is going to be something in the future? Some sort of. It's hard to tell. Um, I, you know, it's not scientific. My gut tells me yes. Uh, but of course this isn't my first rodeo either, but yeah, I, I think it will increasingly have more significance. I think that the timing of it, of, of its finding is also significant, you know, in, in this generation, because, you know, until 1963, we didn't know anything was there and it wasn't until 1994 that Schmidt started the excavations on the site. I, I think something like only 10% of the site has been excavated. It's, it's immense. It's 300 meters square. Uh, so we're talking about a very, a very large site. So we're still learning about it. We're, we're, we're still, you know, getting the minutia and the details. I suspect it's going to be increasingly more important. And if they find uh, pieces of, 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 of an old transformer. Well, I mean, we know it's that, really. that would be an indicator that we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> we're not, a, we're not, a, we're, not a, we're not in Eastern Turkey anymore. It sounds like a movie. Judd, I, Judd, I've got a question about specifics in architecture and maybe you don't know the answer to this, but maybe I, I would suspect that you're the best person to, to answer. If this is the first like real standing stone type temple, right? We have 16 foot, seven to 10 ton rocks. And then we see this replicated 6,000 years later in, in Stonehenge. What is the significance, do you think, of the standing stones, right? I mean, this is the first time we're seeing it, these stones, these big stones, and some are carved and some are not, but stood up. And obviously, they're in the circles. We kind of covered the circle thing. But what's the, do you hypothesize or do you believe it has to do with, with these standing stones? Because we see this now. It, it's replicated again and again and again throughout what we consider like the stone stone age construction megalithic stuff mm -hmm. but why standing stone well again it, it i mean it would be one thing to set uh you know just stones on the ground you know ones that aren't necessarily shaped they're in the raw form and we do see that you know in places like um the napta playa in egypt which is basically an a, a observatory a kind of planetarium because the stones correspond with constellations and planets and there, there's some element, there's some astronomical significance to a lot of these stone circles, Stonehenge being one of them. One of the things about the hinges in Northwestern Europe, particularly the British Isles, is that a lot of them have a trough around them that some scholars have posited contained a, a, a like a moat. And the star watchers or druids or whoever they, they happen, whatever the specialists happen to be, could use this to observe different constellations and celestial movements by looking at the reflections in the in the moat and not having to crane their neck up all the time uh you know to make their observations or confer or whatever so it was kind of a if that thesis holds then in, in, in the cases of places like stonehenge it likely had multiple functions uh, you know, as an observatory and, and also a kind of a temple probably at some point as well. So that's what I'm saying. These roles are not necessarily mutually exclusive, particularly the farther back in time you go, because these people are not drawing the, they're not intellectually compartmentalizing their fields of study uh, or their elements of culture like we do today, which is something that you find in a, a lot of of modern uh, kind of non-literate, non-industrial peoples, you know, that are still living at a Stone Age level. But as for Gobekli Tepe, where you have these clearly anthropomorphic pillars, um, in my estimation, this this is another, you know, reflection of a kind of council of the gods. This is the model that was, you know, it was taken directly from heaven, and as I said, it was perverted for the the fallen angels, the Watchers, their their own particular uses. It, at least to some degree, uh, the circles in a lot of these these sanctified sites uh, are are representations of of that that divine council or a, a perversion of that divine council, if you will. Um, and again, this this is is very much congruent with the the conventional idea that circles represent the celestial, they represent the heavenly, they represent the beyond.
one of the things I think about is like how, how do you see these progress, right? You go from mm-hmm. Bekele Tepe to the Stonehenge, and then you get into Egypt and, the, and these, you know, more what we consider organized, maybe organized civilization, or, or in, sure. and they become these phallic symbols, right? You have these yeah. obelisks and stuff, but it started or, or or statues that have, you know, that that appear more animated. You know, you, sure. you talked about the why did they why did they stand them up? Well, I think that's part of of giving them giving them the the imagery and, and visual tonality of animation you know that these are not just you know stones on the ground but they're meant to represent movement and and posture and things like that do you think that like like we talk about the idols that, of, of the biblical time where they took these idols of stone and and wood and they essentially they tried to do their things to have these inhabited right the, it wasn't that the stones mm-hmm. or the or the wood were anything particular but they tried to have their spirits and these entities inhabit these do you think that's maybe some of what was going on as well were they were they having these in- Abs- absolutely because that idea of um you know what what the the ancient polynesians called mana and it became kind of the the, the catchword for uh animating force you know, in the, in the field of anthropology, you know, this be- belief that, that there was a, a living force uh, within everything, you know, with rocks and plants and animals and people, the sky, every, everything had this in it. And so because you're looking at this, you know, almost laboratory example of the transition between animism, totemism on the one hand and, and the worship of anthropomorphic gods, there's still... In, in terms of ideation and culture, they're still very close to that idea of, of some kind of spirit indwelling. And now that they have identities, easier is probably not the right word, but it, it becomes more organic or natural for them to think of a spirit inhabiting these what, for all intents and purposes, were statuary and idols uh, uh, at the site of Gobekli Tepe. Um, so it wasn't that much of a jump to to believe that, and I, I that I think that's an astute observation on your part, because that that becomes almost a perennial feature in the religions of the ancient world. Yeah. So, Joe, I, I think I got, I've got one question that I, I maybe one final question, and it ha- actually actually I was reading this article this week about um, the re- the rebuilding of the third temple, right? And how there's, a, there's biblical prophecy mm-hmm. about how the temple will be rebuilt mm-hmm. in, the, in the final days. And there's mm-hmm. talk about how the Sanhedrin are working on, or, or we're pushing some of the mayors of Israel to actually, you know, to, to begin the reconstruction of the temple. And we find that in, in biblical prophecy. So my mm-hmm. question, then we talk about Gebegli Tepe in these ancient temples of the watchers. Do you think that there is a strategy? I think Nate kind of touched on this a little bit. Do you think there's an adverse or, or a, other side of the coin strategy that that some of these ancient sites of defilement and to the watchers and to into the to the darkness will also be re, maybe I don't know rebuilt but reinvigorated or reused or repurposed in in the same way that we see the temple be the temple going to be at some point rebuilt in Israel. I think so. I you know and and we've really kind of been been seeing that. Um, uh, you know, I would say. You know, really, ever since the Renaissance, you, you could argue, you know, kind of the beginning of the early modern period, um, when uh, you start to see, and the movement's all tied up in different fields and philosophy and, and literature and art and things like that. When you started to have, you know, uh, societies like the Druids, the Neo Druids in, in England, uh, that I think date back to like this, the late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, you know, this is kind of the the beginnings of uh, what we would today call neo paganism, and it's not uncommon for for those those folks to you know actually go to some of these ancient sites and you know perform their incantations or, or rituals or what have you in, in an attempt to re- recreate that. Now, as far as is, is repurposing in terms of, of, let's say an official capacity, I, I don't know that we've seen that yet, but we're right, in my opinion, um, not just as a believer, but just as a historian of religion uh, and an observer of these things for, for a number of years, I think we're right on the cusp uh, of it. You know, like I say, in a, in a, in a kind of 
Well, it's certainly not in, in the form of a, a, a organized religion. Uh, but I mean, you have, you do have a lot of groups that, that sort of make pilgrimages, you know, to, to these sites in some cases regularly, whether they're dolmens in, in the British Isles or, uh, the ones that are in the Transjordan and in Israel uh, or, or ancient sites like the pyramids of Giza or the Sphinx or the temple at Luxor or, or what have you, this sort of thing, you know, goes on around the world. And of course, you know, there's, there are ancient temples in places like India uh, where the various subdivisions of Hindu, their practitioners still go to those temples. And so I suppose you can make an argument that, that the official use of those structures which are, are for polytheistic religions uh, have have seldom gone out of favor or out of official use. But in terms of a more in, in terms of a broader spectrum of, of these sites being repurposed, I think we are right on the cusp of, of that sort of thing. Well, Judd, Temple of the Watchers, eleven thousand years old, Gobekli Tepe. This is this has been fascinating. I've been actually been wanting to do this and, lo- and looking forward to this because I, I love when we delve back into history. And then we connect it to the to the big biblical timeline and to the biblical narrative. We look at these things um, in that context because it's fascinating. Everything from from the you know the snap, incur, you know infusion of technology to the building of you know to an agrarian society just coming out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. You know, this thing was ignored for years. I think it's also fascinating. I, when you said that, I think of Enoch and how mm-hmm. you know Enoch was is really. Was, was supposed to be was written for a time as this it would be rediscovered or re or yeah you know and, and here we are with more you know just just more history that mm-hmm. just points back to the things that we see in the biblical narrative and and the begin the beginnings of you know of the great war that we find ourselves in now yeah and it, i mean it's an exciting time observe that this stuff is is just sort of unfolding right in front of our eyes but and at the same time, we're kind of, you know, people that that move in these, you know, in these circles like we do, we're kind of we're kind of the speakeasy of truth and knowledge, you know, in the 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 new era of prohibition where knowledge and truth are 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 under prohibition and censorship. And it's like I used to tell my my students, it doesn't matter, but people are hungry. More people are hungry for that. You know, and that's, I think that's a good thing. And I, but I used to tell my students, you know, it doesn't matter if it's cocaine or tickle me Elmo, if you make it illegal, (laughs) there's already this sort of, you know, illicit market for it. But, you know, that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, And it's, it's becoming increasingly more so now, you know, all joking aside. I agree. I'll have a double. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Make me a triple. Yeah. Well, Judd. Always great to have you, Dr. Judd Burton. Uh, hey, I know this is, you wrote in a book, and so talk. Tell us where, when maybe when the book's coming out. Um, oh man, yeah, which book? Uh, fourth, fourth quarter, coming up pretty quick for the Gobekli Tepe, I think. And um, the tentative title is "The Guardians of Gobekli Tepe," and uh, it's a look at at Gobekli Tepe in the Bible. I've got another one coming up. Um, It'll probably be ready for October called the Van Helsing Way, which is about a biblical perspective on vampires and werewolves and zombies and ghouls and kind of the folkloric manifestations of the demonic. October. It's a good timing. Look at this guy, a marketing, marketing whiz here. Let's get it up for Well, I, wouldn't, I don't know about marketing whiz, but, it, you know, people are, are – that's a good time to have those conversations yeah. with yeah. people is because they're already, you know, they're already thinking about that, that sort of yeah, thing. So, yeah. so follow Judd on, on Facebook. I know – we do and Judd you've got I know you've got your courses as well so if you want to want to plug those yeah absolutely Uh, and I'm I'm garnering new students every week Uh, you know this this is sort of the material that gets left out of the seminary you know education (laughs) and so if you want that you can get it here all six of my programs uh, are on sale this week for $105 each 
that's one of the lower sale prices that I've had, but I think that this material is so crucial for this time. I want to give people the opportunity to delve into it. And I've got something there for everybody. There's the biblical anthropology that's culture and history. There's biblical demonology speaks for itself. Uh, preternatural morphology, which has become the sort of monsters 101 class. Very, very popular. Uh, world mythology, which would have bearing on what we talked about today. Um, in an ancient Near East and uh, also a, a Mediterranean civilization program as well. Judd, I'm, a, I'm getting in one of these times, Judd. I, I see it all the time. I keep thinking, man, when, I, when I, my work slows down a little bit for me, I'm, I'm, I'm coming. I'm going to be in, I'm going to be in the front row annoying the heck out of you. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait, man. I, I know you'll be, you'll be a great student. Um, and when you finish, if you if you go into the graduate studies, I'll I'll, I'll even put Doctor Meme on your hey, your certificate. Now we're talking. There you now go. we're talking. Although the funny thing is that Nate is actually Doctor Meme. I just get the title. <laughs> we'll have to come up with a suitable appellation for you two then, <laughs> right. Luke. I like it. Well, uh, with a picture of Chris Farley on it, of course. Only Chris Farley. Only. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> But likely, likely by the time you get all this edited and put up, um, the week will have ended. But I tell you what, for your listeners, if they'll they'll just email me at Professor Burton at yahoo.com and put blurry creatures in the subject line, I'll give them the I'll give them the sell price, the one hundred five sell all right. price. All right, deal. You heard it here. Thanks, Jed. Yeah, Jed, absolutely. Thanks for coming on, buddy. I was good to see you, Jed. My pleasure. Thanks, guys, for having me on. Absolutely.